And it's now a good moment to jump into the panel as well, unless someone has immediate questions. I don't see in Slido at the moment, but I'm super intrigued uh, with your talk. So uh, grab a seat. Let's invite back uh, Peter Nordin and also to the stage, Markus Lippus, the founder from a company called Mind Titan. Uh, Markus' background is a scientific bioinformation informatician and uh, who was drawn into data science and he has spent two years at Stux, software technology and applications competence center and now running on his own consultancy on AI. So give a warm wo applause to our, to our panelists to kick off. Great. Uh, I would like to start with, uh, with Markus' part to give you um, an opening word. Um, um, I have wor heard from your clients that have been working with you, some telcos, and they're super happy with the work, and, and uh, especially around the first topic, economic impact and revenue of investments in AI. That what's your experience in, uh, with your clients? How do they really measure if it's worthwhile to invest money into your solutions, and how do you uh, measure the results? Um, well, actually, it's a, it's a really good question in the sense that it's, it seems to be a very common problem in implementing AI anywhere uh, because people have a, have a weird approach to machine learning projects in general. Uh, I mean, if, if people knew how to approach them, if people uh, looked at machine learning projects as they do any other business project they have, uh, nobody would have that question. You measure the KPIs that are endemic to the process itself. But uh, what's the issue here is that a lot of people think of machine learning projects like IT projects. So they order an IT project and let the IT handle all of it, including measuring. So uh, a good example is that uh, yesterday I just got back from Saudi Arabia and we were talking there with uh, some government agencies about implementing uh, machine learning in their, in their, in their uh, organizations. And uh, the issue there with, uh, with a machine learning project they were doing right now was also that uh, the metrics they were using the, to measure how the model performs were mostly regarding model accuracy, which is fine. Like, you're supposed to measure how good your model is, like how many times it's right versus how many times it's wrong. It's, it's critical. But uh, it's not a business metric, so it doesn't give you anything about how valuable the investment is. Uh, so what, what is important in making machine learning projects is that from the outset, when you define the problem itself, you also should understand like what are the things I'm actually trying to optimize, where are the pl places I can, I can uh, gain an actual advantage. So in the sense of, uh, in the case of fraud, for example, which was the topic there a lot, was it's, you should uh, not measure only how many times I catch fraud, but also how expensive is it to solve those cases and how much money can I save by uncovering those cases, how much extra money do I save by the fact that people know that I'm now measuring fraud by using machine learning, I'm more active so people are less likely to commit fraud. It's like you take all these into account and you put that into a dashboard so that when a, when a, when a business per person looks at it, they not only see like how uh, good the model is, but also this month, approximately this much money got saved because of these things. And this compares to the baseline, which is either random selection or uh, whatever you used before. So, so it, it has to be defined in, in more business KPI terms. And this is what I see that people don't really do. They don't think of machine learning in business process ways, but they should. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other comments on how to set the right KPIs to, to start implementing machine learning process? Enterprise okay. Estonia has explicitly stated that they will not give money for any projects which are not giving a measurable 10% increase in efficiency. I had, I had somebody, somebody from the audience asked after that, I have 10 persons, if I fire one, would it be okay? <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's what the thing, like you say again, like 10% efficiency, which I can measure in machine learning model metrics. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's because like, from my perspective, the issue with the metrics isn't that you're not just measuring the right things. It's that if you don't measure the things that the people who pay for the project understand, then they're not going to pay for the next one, which for me, as a machine learning consultant, is really bad. Yeah. Peter, what's your experience? Yeah, no, I, I would entirely agree. I mean, I think the metrics uh, and connecting sort of machine learning accuracy metrics to business metrics is an important part of it. I think sort of you, in most cases, you 
you need to start from the very beginning for understanding the business objective and then understanding sort of what data you have. Then you have some type of a model which has some metrics indeed. Uh, and then eventually understanding what business processes you are really sort of touching uh, with that solution. And I think sort of the gap between that and the way that, that companies and organizations look at AI projects or machine learning projects is, is usually quite, quite big. And, and in many cases, what we actually need is sort of a sort of fully transformative project uh, that, that accounts for like cultural changes, accounts for a lot of other factors than just sort of having a model that is somehow independently measured. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, uh, I'm, or let's say, I'm not sure all the organizations are mature enough today to buy a, a separate te technology project. Uh, I think actually when you talk about the cultural changes, then like what comes to mind again is that sometimes the things you have to measure are completely not related to the business process itself. Like, um, for example, if you do automate um, something related to uh, customer service, then something that you will be uh, influencing as well is customer satisfaction. So uh, there are uh, like an immense number of metrics that different companies use for that, and they just forget that this is something you should also measure. Like, uh, does it rise? Does it fall? Like, okay, you're 10% more effective, but maybe your customers kind of hate your customer service now. Uh, this, this, is, this is something that should be kept in mind, but like you have to bring in like extra know-how from like completely other, uh, other, other part of the business. No, this happened to Uber in Florida, I think, where they had this, some sort of uh, hurricane going on and all of a sudden the Uber's AI realized that there's a big demand for the taxis mm -hmm. for the long mm -hmm. ride. Woo, let's increase the price. And all of a sudden they started to climb like twofold and then got the really, really bad PR. By artificial intelligence point of view, it was kind of the same decision because there was demand and money had to be made. But uh, maybe if you maybe if you make the machine learning algorithm have a really long perspective, like if I am a douchebag right now, how is this going to affect the bottom line of Uber in two years? <laughs> we established we established for exactly that kind of question. We established the artificial artificial intelligence lab. Actually, it's called AI and Humanity Lab in the Academy of Arts here in Estonia to, to explore that boundary mm. between the, the humans and the machines because there's a lot of decisions which make perfect sense, like killing all the humans because they waste the planet, but we're not going to like them. So, so you're trying to define the borders of uh, what would be okay to give the machine and whatnot? Uh, we don't even have the language to describe it too well at the moment. They say emotional quantifiers, they are being developed, but we are not having kind of industry standard approach how to describe it, how to do that, or even how to measure it. We don't know that based on the humans either. We are not very good at translating our emotions beside, uh, beside giving them a lot of explanation, but how to, how to mathematically formulate how you feel is kind of difficult. If you could run a machine learning algorithm on uh, understanding all the decrees in net promoter score, for example, where, where anywhere people get unsatisfied and learn these moments and try to uh, reverse engineer some patterns out of that to, to understand what makes people angry and not to do such things and, and to, by default, to train robots to uh, operate in these boundaries, would that work? That's actually a really interesting idea, and like from the top of my head, I would think that it definitely has enough merit to give it a try, but I haven't seen it tried before. Like, Peter, maybe you have experience with something like that? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sure the like NPS, Net Promoter Score, is, is being used in, in many cases. I think it's a, probably a good way of measuring. I mean, in various business applications, you have usually various business metrics. I think it's pretty common in a sense. Um, and. Uh, um, it's not obvious that it's always being done so, but, uh, but I, I, I do think actually sort of, um, I don't feel that that's actually a significant challenge in a sense at the moment. I do think that those that know what they're doing, they, they're doing it in a correct way. Uh, I think there's, like there might be challenges with side effects, for instance. The, the, the Uber case was, was one, I think they did, th this was one, but the other they did was also when there were fires. So they were basically guiding all the taxis through the fire because there was no traffic. <laughs> uh, but, but I mean, these are side effects, right? You don't correct that really with a metric uh, in, in a sense. I mean, you can add certain sort of additional 
uh, uh, you know, limits and thresholds and so forth. But, but anyway, I mean, you're, you're going to teach a machine learning solution to do a sp very specific task. And that's something you're explicitly teaching to it. It's not sort of something that uh, happens to be there, but it's explicitly done like that. And, and in that sense, I mean, the, the question is then, how do you take care of side effects like that, which are outside of the metrics, actually, usually? But is it a matter of ambition? Like, um, I listened to M MIT talk with Elon Musk, and he said that when Tesla, when human has to do anything at the Tesla, when uh, auto driving mode, then it's considered as an error, human interaction. So by default, machine can handle everything. And if human needs to turn the wheel, then that's a problem in the algorithm that human needed to turn the wheel at that, that point. Well, I mean, on, on my slide on super intelligence, Elon was among the philosophers here. So, uh, so I think, uh, uh, I, I mean, the, uh, I, I, self-driving cars are uh, existed at, uh, or are divided into five different levels. We don't have level five, we don't have level four. Um, some say they have level three, and, uh, and, and, and that basically means that they're helping you with certain, very certain specific functions. And, and, and I think that's, that's the reality. Uh, uh, the, the, I'd say that the difficulty there is, uh, I mean, it's a failure when a human needs to I intervene, yeah, I, I guess, in a sense, but that's reality today. Um, but the difficulty is the interaction between the machine and the human. So how do you basically build uh, sort of assisted driving uh, that is fully in charge and then switch between the human and the machine? And, and those sort of moves are very challenging indeed to do safely uh, because you need to make sure uh, that this interaction happens actually in a, in a certain safe way, which you, you, you cannot basically intervene. Mm, kind uh, of like a hat, handover with a chatbot, with customer conversation agent, how to deliver enough uh, information from a chatbot to, to hand over to correct in, human. In, in a sense, that's a lot easier because uh, like, when you, like the, the customer service agent, like or any, in any human in the loop system, when you hand the loop over to, to the person and the person is there and knows what to expect. They know that this is the task that is coming. I have a, a dashboard showing all the information that previously happened, but then suddenly, uh, when, when you're in a car, then uh, like, say that there's a situation that the machine knows that I can't handle this net right now. It has to, like, I understand that what you were talking about is like how to let the person know that now you've got to take over. Like, maybe the person is engaged in a book or watching a movie, and you have to take it, okay, you have half a second to turn the steering wheel right now. And, like, of course you're not going to make it. Uh, but the car can't tell you earlier either because it just doesn't have time. Mm, yeah. I'm intrigued. I, I, yeah. Just Charlie, I mean, I think this is precisely the thing. I mean, the, the, there's a difference between human in the loop and human on the loop. And, and the cars are usually called human on the loop solutions because basically you are able to intervene and, and the interventions are challenging to handle. Or where to avoid intervention because it's pretty dangerous when you have two cars going towards each other with 200 kilometers per hour, and the cars are perfectly aware that they have 15 centimeters between each other, so it's okay to go like that. And now all of a sudden, one of the drivers is trying to grab the control <laughs> over the car and messing yeah. it all up. So. Maybe, maybe like, if the car knows that everything is perfectly fine, it'll just like tell you, that, to, like, because it knows ahead of time that it has to intervene, it'll just tells you that, hey, look away now for 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Intriguing. So, so where do we think which industries are there any industries that are safe from this AI transformation? I would start from Andrus. You recently started a company. You like uh, music equipment, right? You you stound, started an amp amplifier company that makes better amplifiers with, with machine learning algorithms than any of analog al amplifiers could be. Although this has been an industry where audio fields has say, oh, digital is crap, I, I, I like my old school, I, play, I pay 100 times more for my old school stuff that is so much better sound. When will it be that AI will be able to revolutionize any of conservative businesses or it's about matter of um, user behavior, so. Well, first, will you be able to make better amplifiers? The AI will 
change every business as much as there is an imagination of the people to, to use the AI. Uh, on the audio, you, you actually ruined my entire morning because uh, I knew that you're going to ask that question, and then I had to think of what what would it be, what would make the good example, what would, I should come up with a good example, and uh, and then I realized that <laughs> I've looked at the wrong direction because it's already happening. Uh, we did a survey about uh, what people want about audio systems, and uh, somewhat. Two great surprises came out of this uh, the survey. It was about 120, 130 people who participated. It was a l rather long list of questions. And two conclusions came out. The first conclusion was that everybody who answered that, maybe it was because nobody else bothered, but uh, everybody rated that the sound quality would be a top priority, which was strange because I never thought that so many people would pay so much attention to the audio. The other surprising outcome was that the lowest importance for everybody was that their friends could access their music system with their phones to play their own songs. So nobody <laughs> likes friends at home. <laughs> but, um, but, but quite highly ranked were all kinds of things we proposed which would do or deal about how to adapt music and how to adapt sound to the specific listener and the specific room. So, all of a sudden, we had this whole group of features which were totally software-related about room correction, about correcting music after the analyzing the material, what it is, uh, recalibrating it based on the quality that had been recorded and things like that. So I think if we talk about audio and if we talk about music, the intelligent algorithms to tweak the material so that it would be more pleasant for us would probably be the, the big thing. And, and it's quite difficult to do the analysis of the audio with the classical methods. So it probably has to be a self-learning algorithm which decides for you how you want it to be sound, how the composer wanted it to sound, and how it should sound, and make the decision what to adjust based on that. So, so I mean, so many words, yes. So how about other in industries? Uh, will there be? Uh, there's a question also, a couple of bunch of questions from audience. One is like any areas where AI implementation is currently not reasonable or advisable. Uh, I could find quite many, but uh, in the sense <laughs> that when uh, uh, people talk about uh, AI disrupting industries, then um, I think that this is unlikely to happen in, in almost all industries. Because like the, the, the effect that AI is having, like with what Peter also talked about quite like what I saw as the main focus is that the AI currently we have is narrow and it needs people. And, uh, it's augmentative rather than replacive. Like even when you take, for example, like customer service, which uh, like most of people who come to us are dealing with in some way or another, then customer service will never be completely automated because like there are always like first there are sales opportunities, there are things that are too complex, and there are always people who want to talk with people. So, uh, but what machine learning will do at the start, when you start implementing it, it is it will take over the most boring and most repetitive things. So it will, uh, for example, answer questions related to where my bills are or where is my support check coming in. For, like this is social social ser services often deal with like people asking repetitive same questions all the time. So. Uh, these kinds of applications are the most useful for most uh, industries, like taking away the bulk of the stupid work, and at the same time, it doesn't disrupt the industry. All it does, it frees up the people's time to deal with the more complex stuff. Because in most cases, uh, with customer service, as, as we have probably all experienced as customers when calling in somewhere or dealing with customer service agents, it isn't, the issue isn't that... Uh, uh, um, the issue isn't that there aren't... Um, like. Uh, that they, they would need some extra intelligence to deal with it. And uh, the, what, what they really need is, is just there to be more time for people to deal with your complex issues. So uh, I think that in a lot of sectors, even the people aren't going to get replaced by machines that soon. Like at some point, yes, probably. In self-driving cars, I see that happening. But, but in most sectors, I don't see even people getting replaced. I see people being augmented and services getting more effective and more pleasant. It has, it has a fundamental flaw, though, because uh, throughout all historical events where we had economic paradigm changed, all communists have contemplated with an idea that the money which will now be saved will still be given to the workers, mm -hmm. which never really happened. So the question is that although we would like what you said to be true, 
the hard economics will probably say that these people will not be available for something else, but they will be immediately optimized out from the uh, system. No, no, I, w I was more talking about dealing with the same problem, like uh, you're doing the same okay, work. Okay, the same problem It's just indeed, that, like, yes. not, not like 80% of your calls aren't going to be something you can answer with a template answer. It's going to be the more complex questions mm -hmm. like that, that actually still need a person. But I, I think that is a good point. I mean, in a sense, I, I, th this is my view as well, and I entirely agree with the fact that repetitive, like, manual labor, a lot of that is going to be taken care of in, in many of the, say, office work type of activities. Uh, but, but basically, and, and then how the economics goes, you know, depends obviously on many things, but in, in several cases, yes, th this is how it goes. But at the same time, I think what this basically implies is that uh, w what, it, what it requires from the labor force is that we develop the skill set that we as humans actually need to perform the tasks that we are better at. And, and, and usually that relates to, say, creative work or dealing with complex tasks and connecting various, various types of topics together or just purely sort of people skills, uh, relationship skills. Um, and, and I think obviously, in a sense, if the, if the labor force that is in place doesn't have this skill set, then s certainly the impact on, on the sort of the economics is going to go this way. Uh, but on the other hand, if the labor force that you have in place is actually highly skilled on these tasks that machines aren't skilled at, then, then uh, you know, the, the outcome will be different. So, so I think it's, it's really important to understand sort of what we actually mean and what actually sort of changes because it's not that we will sort of be totally transforming industries. Um, but we're just going to basically automate certain tasks and change basically the work that you do. Um, and, 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 and I think, you know, th those are significant changes, but, but they're just purely related to individual tasks. I was intrigued from uh, Andrew's point with this communist approach, uh, where to put the money. Uh, AI can often tell us where to put the money, where not, well, for example, uh, in which keywords to bid on Google that we would get the transactions to be done, that customer will take a loan or whatever will happen afterwards, automatic bidding and, and so on. So would it be uh, possible to make an algorithm to say to which individual we should give this spare money? Uh, I think now we're coming actually back to the start of the, the discussion where we talked about metrics. Like when you build a machine learning algorithm, then you let it optimize some goal. Like you have a task that is supposed to optimize, it learns mm -hmm. and optimizes the task super well. And uh, I think if you build a machine learning algorithm that is going to divide uh, divide wealth between people, then it's going to do that exactly based on the metric that I told it to optimize. So uh, it's, in a sense, it's not going to, um, it cannot find you the ideal solution. It's going to find you the best solution to fit the objective you just gave it. So in a sense, in a sense if you build a machine like that, it's just still just going to do what the algorithm builder thought is the best way to share money in the, in the, in the economy. Fair enough. Which is, which is why I mentioned at the last slide on the presentation that the arms race of an AI is pretty important because otherwise those who will not be able to counter-optimize will probably be the word. They will be quite difficult positions. On that note, a question from audience. Returning to Andrew's final point, smart people on the stage, please figure out how it would be cheaper to start flying directly so flying backwards can stop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, like, so as, as much as like, this, this deals solely with logistics, and uh, as much as I have uh, been in contact with uh, logistics, either companies dealing only with logistics or having logistics issues, then in most cases, um, machine learning doesn't deal with the logistics part itself. You, ha you have, you have uh, algorithms that are, like, when machine learning is, uh, uh, probabilistic, meaning that it doesn't give you the best choice. It gives you, uh, with some probability, the choice it thinks is right. Then uh, with logistics, you have most of the problems are solvable completely or, uh, or not solvable at all, um, at least with current, current knowledge we have. Um, and I, I think that machine learning only like, um, fits in uh, as a like, previous step from uh, optimizing the, the flying part altogether. For example, when uh, 
uh, a logistic problem we, we were reason to were solving is uh, sol uh, solving for inspectors. Inspectors are there are few, too few of them. They have to inspect the like a number of different factories and establishments. Are they following the rules and so on? And um, uh, one of the parts you can optimize is like what the route is that they go through the optimal places when they start their trip. And the second part is like you have to know how long each process takes at different companies. So when you want to optimize the route, you can't do that with machine learning, or at least you don't get any uh, foreseeable benefit from it. Where you can use machine learning is you predict, like taking into account this company's history, their sector, what we know about them, what people there are, how large it is. I can predict what are the steps that I need to take when I want to inspect it, like what are the actions that I need to do there, and how long each action is going to take at this company. So I can like, make an educated guess, like get, an, get a source information to start optimizing the route. But the aut route optimization will still be done by something else, at least as far as I know, maybe Vete has... Yeah, but, 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 but there's this, there is this thing that in order to achieve that, we have to look at the much, much larger picture. We can't, we can't just optimize out that it, how would it for me to be cheaper to fly directly than through London. It's about when I have to be there. It's about, it's, it's literally about the person I have to meet in Jakarta has to schedule whatever we have to do based on what would be most efficient about the resources, which would also somehow miraculously encounter some other guy sending his car with the plane from one world to another because that all of the sudden matters and makes the small difference that I can fly with a different route. So it's, it's, it's a huge optimization, optimization matrix, matrix and, and, and it takes a lot of different social behaviorism than we have today. Yeah, I mean, it might be the case that AI isn't solving this problem or all problems. We might have to look into some of the other technologies, right? I mean, it could be something that you can you would look into augmented reality instead and try to solve it with that. But I mean, this hammer is not going to solve all of the problems, right? So I, I, but I do th agree in a sense that it's the level of abstraction that we have. And, and quite often we, we go very, very deep into details and just sort of focus on how do we now with this hammer solve that problem. And in, in many cases sort of it might be in the underlying structures or in the data that we have or, or something totally different that is going to actually allow us to allow us to solve solve it but but on the logistical side i don't have a solution are there some samples uh, examples from your work where you have learned that them this ai definitely is not a hammer here we shouldn't use it you you have tried we optimistically and then figured out it doesn't work yeah, I, would, I would say it, it often happens before anything gets built a customer comes to you with an issue, and mm. you think about the issue, you let them map out the process, and then you somehow softly have to tell them that you, you shouldn't be using AI. Like, just, mm -hmm. sometimes it's, it's more like, sometimes it's that the issue that they're trying to solve takes, uh, you map the process out with them, and then you realize that the process requires one person to do three hours of work every month. Uh, and the alternative would be uh, paying 20,000 euros for a machine learning solution. And it just doesn't make sense economically. And at other times, uh, someone asks you to solve a machine learning project, and you think about this, and, and, and you realize that this is, this is like beyond the bleeding edge. This will be a research project. Like, I can tell you, all I can tell you is I will work on it for three months, and then I can tell you if it's feasible. And uh, in often, like often uh, it, it just doesn't make sense to even, even go and try this from an economical standpoint again. How at all to make these things work uh together with like real scientists who are full-time scientists and want to do great stuff and, and want to apply it for businesses? What are the keys in, in making this happen in reality? Having a war so you would be able to put that all in the work. It always worked very well. <laughs> what do you need to do? <laughs> all great technologies which have been in the lab, they've been sitting there until there will be a large war and everybody needs every resource to fight an enemy. So they will be all carefully dusted and put on the field. <laughs> this is how technology advances. Mm. Space race, another very good. Mm. Mm. So, uh, but Peter, your PhD experience, how, how do we really work? Science this works together with businesses on AI. Yeah, no, I certainly hope we can find a way to cooperate without the war. But, uh, <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question. It's, it's, it's a it's it is challenging in in many cases i i think uh so i mean we are we are basically a team with with 
mostly PhDs and uh, uh, most 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 in our team have a say 10 to 15 year background in academia before they've joined us and and that means that they come from a bit of a different world um, but I think it's mostly sort of interesting what what actually drives uh, sort of it's mostly about understanding what actually drives different people so I mean uh, we are also working very very actively with various types of universities and and research groups and we've set up in Finland for instance a program on 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 working together with with one of the leading universities uh, and and companies so that uh, sort of part of proof of concept AI projects uh, also have a re small research component and from the very beginning we sort of enter the project with the university and also involve researchers that can focus purely on research have basically no uh, uh, delivery responsibility in the in the POC or so and, uh, and that's an explicit wish that certain companies have that they would involve that type of uh, activities as well. But, but I think uh, I think it actually requires quite a quite a, quite a sort of good setting to be able to do that because you need to understand what actually drives a researcher and how that could be beneficial for a company. Uh, now then, what we do basically has very little to do with research. I mean, we are customer oriented in the sense that we build solutions for our customers and, and, and certainly some of the skill set that researchers have is, is beneficial. But, uh, but I think the mindset that you, you need to have in, in customer projects is very, very different. Are there, are there anything about corporate culture that definitely needs to be in place or, or changed during the AI related projects? You mean like pertaining to what Peter was just talking about, or in general? Both. Uh, fine, yeah. I would. I think that we're, we're like as you said, you're mostly implementing, and you're customer oriented. That like very much gets in the way of applying research in like a science sense. Uh, exactly in the case that you have to have in, in when you deal with um, businesses, especially with large and old businesses, they need to know what the deliverables are and they need to know the timelines, and they need to know all that, and that just doesn't go uh, hand in hand with research. Mm. So um, I would say that if, you, if the, a company wants to be like completely on the bleeding edge of, of, of machine learning and AI, then uh, they would need to adopt solution akin to what Google and Facebook uses, that they have their own research groups, mm -hmm. which don't have any deadlines, and just mm. go and play with this. It's interesting, and, and you, do, you do that. But this requires a lot of, lot of investment and from the company, and this is very hard to get. Uh, so what's our chance like, at all against GAFA when they have thousands of data scientists uh, doing some research and being super clever? Well, I, I think that like, actually the chances are, aren't that bad from the, uh, o from the obvious perspective in the sense that they have a lot of scientists because um, machine learning is very uh, an open science. Uh, a lot of the best scientists that go to these kinds of companies go, to, go there only, with, only on the only on the requirement that they must be able to publish what they do. So the science itself gets published. Uh, what they do have a, a, an uh, unavoidable advantage in is that they have all the data, uh, which makes training algorithms a lot simpler for them. But I think that the biggest uh, hindrance to, to uh, adopting machine learning and AI in, uh, in most companies is, is comes from the, one of the slides you showed earlier which is the, like, how ready are people to adopt, to adopt AI? Do they plan on adopting AI? When you look at that graph, then there's a huge amount of companies that haven't implemented anything and have no plans of implementing anything. And if you're going to a company that has this kind of approach, then uh, nothing is going to happen at all. Mm -hmm. I think like, everything starts from openness, and from that you can move to wherever you like. It's just going to take time. What's your biggest fear related to AI? Every individual answer. I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid of the technology itself. I mean, it's, it's we as humans that are building the stuff that we, and, and eventually, I mean, still uh, nothing, nothing is being built on its own. Uh, so, mm, I think my, my, my fear would, would be related to your previous question, actually, in a sense, what could we do, what could we, could we do here in, 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 say, Europe to make sure that we sort of have the, the the talent needed because it's basically about talent, um, and uh, and it is it is currently a competition between between uh, 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 different continents and countries, 
and the US and, and, and China have been at the forefront and investing a lot of, a, a lot of resources into to building those capabilities. And, and in Europe, we are, we are a bit lagging behind. We even don't know how, how far they are, basically. To some extent, in, yeah. indeed. And, and I think the important part is that we would have enough talent, say, for a co small country like Estonia and Finland, we would make sure that there is enough talent that is available for companies to build products rather than being only within one specific company and not available for others. And I think a lot of the talent at the moment is sitting with large big tech companies like Google and Facebook and not being available to others. In some sense, like that, uh, the fact that they are in uh, Facebook and Google uh, is, could be kind of beneficial in the sense that when they leave there, then they have also, like wh what I see is lacking a lot is experience of conducting these projects. Like uh, when, when you, like what other companies do is that they hire, like they need, understand they need a data science component, they hire a chief data scientist, and the chief data scientist is supposed to handle everything. And maybe the chief uh, uh, data scientist is, 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 is uh, has a, like, just did their PhD, has extensive research background, but doesn't really know how to implement these in, in actual like, practice, like how to make things work uh, good enough, but stable enough. And uh, then th this, is, this, this is also like a blocker for adopting data science. So for example, if, if those people are working then in Facebook and, and, and Google and, and, and Spotify, then um, if they leave at some point and go work somewhere else, they take their experience with them. But the issue is more that I think they, they go and work at Facebook and Google, not in their London offices, but in their San Francisco offices. And then mm -hmm. they're not coming back, which may, 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 may be more an issue. But I think this is actually a point where, where uh, I do actually believe it is a significant risk that, that uh, we are not only giving a lot of our data to big tech companies, but we are also giving most of our talent to big tech companies. And I do actually think that this, it, is, it is a significant, significant challenge. And we need to have ways to keep in, in Finland and in Estonia to keep the best people in, in the country. Because uh, at least in Finland, we've had a lot of people leave for big tech companies uh, that are sort of world-class talent. Um, is there anything that politicians could do about it? Definitely, in the sense that what, what I see that drives, uh, I suppose it's the same in Finland, but that these tr people who, who like the best of the best, they aren't really driven by the money they can make. They don't go to Google because Google pays them a lot, although that's also a factor. But it's also the fact that you know that you can do interesting work somewhere else. Like if, somewhere, if someone tells you that, uh, g come and help us uh, research new medicines in, in Bayer, you would go there. But, uh, but a lot of like, the, these opportunities aren't there because uh, a lot of companies aren't ready to invest in machine learning and to, like, aren't so open to do those interesting things. So if you're in Estonia or Finland and you're a machine learning researcher, and you're thinking about going to the private sector, then you're looking for the most interesting problems first. And if you didn't, don't see them at home, then you're gonna just go somewhere else. To generate some interesting problems, uh, we could make uh, all sorts of data sets public. Uh, as was a question from the audience, would businesses rather win or lose from making all possible data sets public? Sometimes it seems that there isn't that much interesting data that isn't public. Uh, that the data that can be made public uh, is not, like, it, it's supplementary data to what a company already has. Like, um, I'm probably, like, there are some things, but so uh, right now, nothing comes to mind that what would be solvable only using the open data, which would be a super interesting problem as well. Well, like, what I think that uh, the state could could do is, for example, they, they don't have to be, they don't have to open the data. You could even keep the data closed, but let something interesting be done in Estonian healthcare, for example. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of interesting data, but nobody can use it, inside or outside the state. And this is something they can change. They can let it, not let it open, which would be criminal and a bad idea but like let someone close to it so that they can solve some interesting problems there. Do you think more, there's a question, who will have better AI systems, public or private uh, sector, why, and should it be otherwise? So it is who should uh, operate this data and, and enable creating systems around this data? That actually, that actually brings me to something which, which I'm worried about, which is a singularity, but not as Kurzweil or, or Jan Dallin talk about it, but an economic, economic singularity. That the ones which employ it faster and more successfully, and the ones which have more money to, to buy the talent, and the advantage you gain 
at some point becomes so huge that it's impossible to catch because you're going to this breaking point of being super efficient. So I don't see governments doing it at all. Even if they have the best efforts, they don't have the resources to pull it off. So it has yeah. to be, or if it happens, yeah. it happens in the private sector. It makes sense to, can you em employ these The question is, The I question do. is if the governments or, or regulatory bodies or whoever is going to regulate it would be clever enough and bold enough to, to equalize that, despite of everybody screaming at them saying that it's communism and shouldn't happen. <laughs> because it, if, it, if it happens, it's going to be bad. But the question is, how do we prevent it? That's so so, so my, my, my bet would be that definitely the governments will not have enough AI in their disposal. Military, probably, to some extent, but not for the public consumption. What no. would be your message to these people, to those, uh, to those people who start to scream, oh, never, don't allow any data to be open, and, and so on? Uh, well, I was leading for a couple of years the Estonian Open Data Project, and... Uh, we decided to make the bold move and published the entire local government financial data real time as an open data. The Ministry of Finance says, that, okay, let's give it a try. And we did all sorts of risk assessments on that before, how it could go wrong and how every single public servant on the local government would be fired and put in jail because journalists will be able to find their 10 different cases every hour. Uh, we published about one-seventh of the entire state budget on that database, which was online accessible. We even created a click view front-end for that to make the simple and quick analysis available. And nobody cared. <laughs> I think we got like a third page small news that all public government data is now <laughs> public. <laughs> it, 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 it had a very nice side effect because every journalist recognized that the data is available. So for entire year, all the articles of this is a thief, this is a thief, this was playing together with... Those articles disappeared because everybody was afraid of that now when you can fact check it, somebody does and says you're a liar. So it was easier not to write anything. So the entire local government disappeared from the news for almost a year. <laughs> so it had all sorts of strange consequences, or could have all sorts of consequences. It, 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 this, I think, is a sign of where the investigative journalism has reached. Like, <laughs> when you don't have, like, people don't have time anymore to dig into data, so they avoid data-intensive data topics altogether. Yes. Is, is that it? <laughs> this is scary. <laughs> we have one of the top tech journalists in the room, uh, you want to comment on that? <laughs> not at that moment. No, he's not he's, digging the data. He's, he's now digging the data. Uh, finally, uh, rather building, trying to be successful individually or having some sort of joint efforts uh, together, uh, can a single company win the AI race? What are the good examples of joint efforts? Which way to go? Hire all these thousand uh, scientists to your, on your own, or have some have some sort of cooperation. I know it's a hard topic for Estonians and maybe Finns as well. But uh, are there any good examples of uh, the, the open data example you brought? Basically, is the is the joint effort. Are there any other good efforts of uh, good examples of working together? I would think that the best, like, joint effort in the private sector is complicated because everyone's competing. Uh, where joint efforts can happen is that companies uh, assist each other with the data with they have, but the companies must be from completely different sectors. Uh, but where the uh, joint effort can be applied best, I think, uh, is the public sector. Because, actually, they're, they're separate organizations, but they are all after the same goal. Uh, and like, the hardest part there is to get people to communicate with each other and to get people to like do make the effort and actually share the data. But I think that there the effect is the strongest because people are kind of motivated to drive towards the same goal and not hamstring each other. For example, is, is um, there's again, again because I just was there 
the example is going to be from Saudi Arabia, is uh, there's the social security uh, branch of the, the, the government that wants to uh, get people back to work as fast as they can. And there are separate organizations that deal with uh, people's health, and there are separate organizations who deal with uh, people matching people against the available jobs. And uh, it's easy, they, they, they all share kind of the same goals in some sense. Like they want people to be uh, well and working and uh, so, and, 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 but they don't really talk to each other. And uh, where, where we reached by the time we were there is that uh, you got the social security people talking to the uh, employee placement people so that they have a joint venture where they share the data and like both sides have actually the, the, the piece of the same picture. So they put the picture together and find the most optimal jobs for the people on the work market available. So, and, and if, the, if that cooperation is already running, then it's going to continue running out of inertia because there is nothing that's going to block it. And unless anyone like severs the connection, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, there's, there's like the competing interests are not going to break it. What's your take, Peter and Andros? Competition versus cooperation. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think that most companies do actually need a partner that helps them um, to, to get going. And, and the needs are quite different depending on the maturity. Uh, if you are at the very beginning of your AI journey, then you certainly need help with sort of developing your own strategy around uh, what you actually want to do and how that's going to impact the rest of the business and, and, and so forth. And I think uh, those sort of transformative questions uh, uh, need to be answered before you jump into doing sort of building out an AI based product uh, and, and, and so forth. And, uh, and then obviously they, there's really different needs for those projects as well. So then you need to actually find someone who can help you with those things. And, um, and, and eventually I think there are quite few examples of companies that have been able to build out like really, really good world class AI teams quickly so uh, so it's 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 not an easy task to go out and recruit a full team of ai experts and build out the team that you actually need so so i do think there is a role i mean i guess in many cases you can do it different you can find a consultant but you can also or consultancy uh, uh, but you can also acquire a team and if you look at how google for instance did then that's what they did with deep mind basically so so you know if you want to go at that level then uh, then usually there there is a need to, to partner up in one way or another. I'm not a great believer of the mankind or its fate. Um, I just recently read a book. Uh, it's called Problem 92, which is about the Russian nuclear physicist Kurchatov, who was basically behind inventing the atomic bomb for Russia. And the part of the book describes in a great detail how at the very beginning of the Second World War, the Nature magazine and other scientific publications, how gradually less and less articles appeared about how is it going with the uranium and, and all different nuclear physics problems. So back in the 30s, it was full of an article as everybody were fighting who's going to be the first to publish their finding. And then it gradually decreased, 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 decreased until for the 1940, there were zero articles about nuclear physics on the nature because everybody was weaponizing it. So I think we are sharing the same fate with an AI that we are collaborating very well together until somebody finds a way of making a huge amounts of money of it or weaponizing it or doing something else with it, which seems beneficial. And then the collaboration gradually dissolves and whoever has the highest stake will, will do whatever their plans were. I think it's in a human or, or capitalist nature of, of, of doing that. And, uh, and once again, in the next 10 years, we see companies who are probably going to be sued by the European Commission or by somebody else because they have exhausted their critical mass of artificial intelligence and should make something public and pay a bazillion dollars for everybody for doing that. So I, I don't think it's going to be easy. I think it's going to be pretty nasty next 10 years. So it took us four hours to first time mention the word Russia in AI conference. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. And, and, and it was in context of 
atomic bomb. <laughs> so, <laughs> with this fun uh, fact, we are ready to move into our uh, dinner part and to mingle on and, and create those meaningful conversations that AI would not be able to create, but those are possible only between humans. So let's thank the panelists.